Sonic the Hedgehog. Sonic the Hedgehog. A series holding some of my favorite games and characters of all time. A topic that I have spoken to my friends about for hours on end. Me being the only speaker in those times. Sonic has been with me since I first gained consciousness on this rock, and has given me some unforgettable memories that I cherish to this day. I've played almost every game in the series, save for the Java phone games in the 2000s. And throughout this marathon, I'll be detailing my thoughts on the first half of this series, from Sonic 1 to Sonic 06. Sonic recently has been on the up and up, with Sonic Frontiers coming out and being generally liked in the fandom, successful movies to boot, and now that new Sonic Superstars game that looks amazing. Can't wait to give that one a look when it comes out. Everything I've seen in the trailers look amazing. But we gotta build up to that point first. And with all this out of the way, let's dive headfirst into this new marathon with Sonic 1 for the Sega Genesis. I never experienced Sonic 1 on the OG Genesis. Most people in my generation probably experienced it through the Sonic Mega Collection, but I didn't play it first there either. Nope. My first ever impression of Sonic was the 2006 GBA port of Sonic 1 Sonic Genesis. Yeah, the one with terrible audio, physics, and glitches. I remember playing this a lot on my DS Lite and not being able to get past Marble Zone Act 3 for the longest time, but when I did, my celebration was quickly shot down when I got to Labyrinth Zone. Never once did I get past this. The bad physics combined with the water made this zone the one I would permanently be stuck at for as long as I had the game. Later on, when I had my PS3, my dad came home one day and graced me with Sonic's Ultimate Genesis Collection, and here I was able to play the Genesis originals of Sonic 1, 2, 3, and Sonic and & Knuckles, which was where my love for the classic games got kickstarted. The speed of Sonic was different from anything I've ever played before at that point, and the levels were tall and big and had all these cool sound effects and was ticking all my 5 year old boxes. I put a lot of time into Sonic 1 between the GBA and the collection, and I eventually beat it years later. I was a kid, so I sucked at video games, so it took a long time for me to actually beat Sonic 1 properly, but Sonic 1 was the spark for me, but wasn't the game that got me hooked. It was actually my second Sonic game I ever played that hooked me, and no, it wasn't any of the classic games. I'll get to that game in the future. But is Sonic 1 still fun to play today? Let's find out. But first, some background. The year is 1988, and in the past, Sega had limited success in trying to break Nintendo's chokehold on the video game industry. So Sega hosts an in-house competition to create a rival character to Nintendo's Italian plumber, one that they wanted to be as iconic as Mickey Mouse. In 1990, Sega ordered their in-house devs to make a game featuring this character, as he would be the new mascot and face of Sega. The team went and developed the engine, gameplay mechanics, and decided to develop a game around speed. With this decision, a ton of concepts were thrown around as to what the main character would even be. The team wanted animals associated with speed, so they thought of a kangaroo, a squirrel, and a rabbit. None of these really stuck though. The rabbit showed promise as originally they were going to make a game featuring him using his ears to grab enemies, but the Genesis couldn't handle a complex game like that, so the idea was scrapped. Eventually, the team decided they wanted to feature an animal that could roll into a ball, so the choice came down between an armadillo and a hedgehog character. Naoto Oshima was the artist who proposed the Hedgehog, and the team favored that design over the Armadillo. And just like that, Sonic the Hedgehog was born. Rocking a design inspired by Felix the Cat mixed with Mickey Mouse, and shoes inspired by Michael Jackson and Santa Claus. Michael being seen with the buckles and Santa with the colors. Of course, the Hedgehog needed an antagonist. And that's how Dr. Robotnik was born. Or Eggman. The devs in the American and Japanese division argued about the names and just chose to use their respective names in their respective regions. A sign of things to come. They really wanted this game to be the Mario killer. The design of Sonic was made to be cooler than Mario, and more importantly, he rocked that 90s edge that made him popular with the kids. They were firing on all cylinders with this one, including the music. It's well known that Sonic games didn't have amazing music, but even in the first game, they valued the music's quality, as Sonic Team commissioned Masato Nakamura, the bassist and songwriter J pop band, Dreams Come True. And while he was unfamiliar with making music on a computer, he made a OST that's pretty damn good. Green Hill Zone has really good music. In fact, Every zone in this game has great music that stays in your head after you turn the game off. When this game released on June 23rd, 1991, it was EVERYWHERE! Mostly due to it being a pack of title with the Genesis and being cheaper than SNES, but Sonic was here and he was taking the world by storm. There are plenty of ways to play Sonic 1 and frankly all the Genesis games these days, but for these videos I think I'll stick to emulating them. Except for Sonic CD, I'll go into why in the next video. But while there are definitely a ton of fan-made ROM hacks that improve each of the Genesis games, I want to look at the original game, but if you wanted to play these games nowadays, I recommend you seek out your Sonic 1 Forever, your Sonic 2 Absolute, and the most popular Sonic 3 Air. The Sonic Origins collection may be fine for casual audiences, but for Sonic fans, I couldn't recommend a version of these games missing so many basic quality of life features that other collections and other franchises have, not to mention the bugs present in the game. So what's the plot of Sonic 1? Well, you're Sonic, and the evil Dr. Robotnik is turning animals into robots. Go stop him. Seems pretty simple on the surface, right? 
but there's a lot more to it than that. Strap in folks, it's time for your first dose of Sonic lore. Since the US manual didn't really go into detail about where this game takes place or what these things are, most fans go towards the Japanese manual for the stories of the classic games. For Sonic 1, this island is actually known as South Island, where the elusive Chaos Emeralds reside. Chaos Emeralds have immense power and can be used for a bunch of things, but in this game specifically, Robotnik wants to use them to power his weapon so he can take over the world. Robotnik thought he could just come to the island and dig the Chaos Emeralds up, but of course things can't be that simple. As you see, South Island is actually moving at all times, and while it moves, it creates a distortion that the Chaos Emeralds exist within. All this is straight from the Japanese manual. Robotnik is still turning the animals here into robots, but you get this extra flavor text that I appreciate as someone who actually likes Sonic lore and its world building. I mean, it explains the trippy special stages, which as a kid I used to be very confused by the sudden imagery of birds and fish and the spinning level design. Which while we're here, these are not my favorite special stages in the series. I find the spinning level to be more annoying to navigate more than anything, it feels more like I'm actively fighting the stage and while I can clear them easily now, I end up usually skipping these on repeat playthroughs. The way you get in here is by collecting 50 rings and then jumping into the big ring at the end of the level. Rings are how you stay alive in Sonic. Collect 100 to get an extra life, then get hit and watch as your life savings go away. Get hit with 0 rings and you die and respond to the last checkpoint you touch. These are the checkpoints. They're blue when they're unactivated and when you pass them they spin and turn red. That's how you know they're on. Technically speaking you only need one ring to survive so as long as you can hold on to that, you're good. Every level ends when you spin this signpost, but you got a good couple seconds to actually jump into the ring. If you take too long, the game will force you forward, and trust me, there is nothing worse than going too fast or missing the jump into the big ring causing you to sit and stare at it while the score tallies up. So do yourself a favor and slow down and time your jumps before you get here. Clearing the special stage requires you to grab the chaos emerald surrounded by these diamonds, which take a little bit to break depending on the color. There aren't other mechanics that play in these stages like these up and down bumpers that speed up or down the rotation of the stage and this R button that changes the direction that the stage spins. The one you want to avoid though at all costs are these goal spears as they instantly kick you out of the special stage and you'll have to try again the next level. In order to get the good ending you have to get all 6 emeralds before you beat the final boss in which you're rewarded with... Flowers in the final cutscene. Yeah these shits aren't worth the trouble. The bad ending is just Eggman dancing around with the emeralds, and uh, not sure how he got them, because that would mean you would have to clear the special stage himself, but hey, that means his fat ass cleared special stage 5, so I say he earned it. It's probably a little weird for me to start off explaining the special stages before the actual main part of the game, but I wanted to focus too on the lore of this series in this marathon, as that to me is the fascinating part of Sonic, even if things get a bit ridiculous later. But what do you do in Sonic 1? Well, you run and you jump. But what makes Sonic different from other platforms is that he runs fast. Like really fucking fast. In order to gain this speed though, you have to engage in what makes these games so unique. The physics. Sonic naturally builds speed when running, but in order to go faster you have to gain momentum by using the stage layout. The speed isn't free, it's a reward for playing well, which is a staple mechanic in almost every Sonic game to some extent. You can't just hop in and expect to consistently go at Mach 3. Running down hills or jumping over stage hires to keep your flow going can get you decent results, but the best thing you can do is roll down hills. Sonic can curl into a ball by pressing down while running. You can use this to roll into enemies and roll down slopes, which will give Sonic his momentum boost causing you to go faster. Sonic also curls into a ball whenever he jumps, which makes you safe and able to destroy enemies and free to capture animals that are inside them. You can also use the spin or rolling moves to break open these monitor TV things. There are four types of monitors. The ring one gives you 10 rings. Breaking the shield one gives Sonic a shield that can take one hit of damage without losing rings. This one is useful for when you're going for the Chaos Emeralds. Then there's the extra life monitor that's self-explanatory, and then the invincibility monitor that makes Sonic invincible for a short period of time. As powerhouses are okay, but they're usually a reward for finding a hidden section inside a wall or using the rolling move to go through a wall to find some hidden secrets. Mastery of these mechanics is key to getting good at the classic Sonic games. Knowing when to curl and when to jump will allow you to blast through these stages at record pace. Usually how levels work is that the top path is the faster path but the more difficult one, and the lower path is the slower but easier path. I've played this game so many times over the years that I'm able to complete a level very fast and comfortably, but one thing recently that I find very evident with most Sonic games is that these games are definitely trial and error games. This gameplay you're seeing are the results of years of playing the game, but first timers will struggle with this. You will get hit, you will die, you will game over. Whenever I watch my friends play Sonic, I often watch them struggle to finish the stage, and that's because Sonic's level design is just different from normal platformers, and the games encourage you to replay them to see if you can get better and improve your skill. But for some people, the initial experience was just too frustrating or annoying and they don't get that drive to improve, and that's okay. Sonic isn't for everybody in that regard, and this isn't even a classic Sonic issue, a lot of Sonic games are rooted in this trial and error design that you overcome on repeat playthroughs. 
Speaking of, you have to overcome each of the game's six zones, which is what a Sonic World is called. First up being the iconic Green Hill Zone. It's a great level that eases you into mechanics and gives you slopes to speed down and has plenty of secrets for you to find. It also teaches the whole top path is fastest thing I mentioned earlier. It's a pretty good starting zone, but it sucks that immediately after is Marble Zone. Marble Zone is a lot more slow platforming focused that with enough skill you can speed through, but I never got why they would follow a zone like Green Hill up with this. Things look up though as you get to Spring Yard Zone, a nice zone that has a good mix of platforming and speed challenges. This zone has a fetish for placing bumpers everywhere though, but hey, I can pick up what this place is putting down. Labyrinth Zone. This zone puts the fear of drowning in every Sonic fan. That music will haunt you after you first hear it, and it doesn't help that what accentuates that anxiety is the fact that Labyrinth Zone is a bunch of spikes, spears, and ball and chains waiting to impale, skewer, and cave Sonic's skull in. The water makes you go extremely slow, and they didn't give Sonic the option to swim because apparently Sonic Team didn't know that hedgehogs are actually pretty good swimmers. I can get through this place pretty easily now, but when things go wrong while I'm here, I tense up a little. Also fun fact, this was supposed to be the second zone in the game. What a flick in the nuts that would have been for players. Anyways, following Labyrinth Zone is Starlight Zone, a really relaxing zone to play through mostly due to the setting and the atmosphere it brings and the music. I know I mentioned it already, but I love every track in Sonic 1. All the zones, including the next one, have great music that I recommend you give a listen to. To cap off the game, we have Scrap Brain Zone. Fuck. Fuck. Ah, oh, shit, 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 fuck. Damn it. Yeah, this zone is cheap shot the stage. If you don't know what's coming, then this zone will not hesitate to hit you with lightning, fire, bus saws, ball and chains, fire, throw you in a million bottomless pits if you take the wrong path, and the one thing I forgot to mention, fire! It's definitely a challenging final zone, and if you stick to the upper path, you can get through it with minimal error, but that doesn't change the fact that Act 3 of this level is a secret Act 4 of Labyrinth Zone. Thankfully though, it's not that bad, as taking this path down here at the start of the level makes this act really short. After completing that, you get the final zone, although I struggle to call it a zone as it's only a fight with the final boss. Bosses in this game aren't anything to write home about. Every zone is split into three acts, with the third one housing a boss at the end. They're all pretty simple and take little time to defeat, except for Labyrinth Zone's boss, which is a chase sequence with rising water, projecting spears and fire, because this zone just had to be so different. The final boss is a decent challenge, having to dodge these electric charges that home in on wherever you're standing, and paying attention to where Eggman comes out as so you can hit him. Once you beat this, you finish the game and get the ending I mentioned earlier. This game isn't very long, if you're good at the game it will take you around 30 or so minutes, maybe an hour, but the reason why I wanted to go so deep and spend this amount of time talking about this game is because, well, I really like this game and love Sonic and wanted to give the first game in this marathon the time it deserves and build up the lore of this series and show how it evolves. If you're interested in playing Sonic's roots, then I recommend this game. It might be tough, but if you stick with it, you'll make it through and maybe even feel compelled to replay it and get better at it. Just don't spend 10 minutes in a level though, that'll give you a time over and you'll lose a life. Also those special stages can give you a continue if you collect enough rings, which will be useful if you burn a lot of lives, as this game has no save feature. You have to play it all in one go, so watch out for that. Anyways, the next part of this marathon won't be Sonic 2, that will be the video after the next one. Next time I see you, we'll be talking about Sonic CD. I don't play this game very much, but I remember when I do, I have a good time with it, so we'll see if that still holds true when I play it and review it. With that out of the way, like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, it helps out a lot with the channel, and I hope you guys have a great day. Peace. And to Sonic, happy 32nd anniversary. Oh,